Welcome, and I hereby call, the, it looks like we are on air now, so I hereby call the Monday, March 25th, 2024, Cumberland Town Council meeting to order. Um, a few items of business here before we get started. We had a uh, 4.30 Finance Committee meeting where we talked about um, last year's financial report that we met with our auditor, which is something that we do every single year. Um, that Those results came out positive, which is great. We then at five o'clock had a budget workshop, which we've been doing right now. It's kind of budget season right, right this second, um, where we met with uh, folks from the, the police department and the fire department uh, talking about some of their new budget requests for the fiscal year 2025 budget. And that brings us now to our normal uh, town council meeting time at 7 p.m. The first item of business is the approval of the minutes, which is from our March 11th, 2024 meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Councilor Kopp. We have a second from Councilor Eads. Any questions or comments about those um, minutes before? I know there was uh, one individual who brought up that in those minutes they referenced 414. Okay, so, yeah. You got that? Okay. Should be, yeah, add 1,000 to that number. 1,415 to those. Um, apart from that, I did not see any other issues or questions from, the, from those minutes. Okay, all those in favor? Unanimous, missing Councilor Filson. Okay, um, that is the approval of the minutes. Before we get into manager's report, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Councilor Douglas, for an announcement. Thank you, Mark. Um, in March of 2023, we started the extensive process of replacing our beloved town manager, William Shane, AKA Bill, from a meeting with department heads to, to identifying qualities that coincided with our community's values. We wanted to ensure we had a strong sense of needs moving into the recruitment process. A subcommittee of the council was subsequently formed in August between myself, Councillor Story King, and Councillor Filson. After an extensive search process and unanimous council agreement, we have identified and secured our next community leader. So with that, we are excited to announce the appointment of Matthew Sturgis as the new Cumberland Town Manager. Matt brings a wealth of experience to this role, along with a demonstrated commitment to collaboration and community engagement. We are confident that his expertise will be invaluable in managing our town's affairs and fostering positive relationships with all community stakeholders. Matt will officially begin his tenure as town manager on Monday, June 3rd, providing a month overlap with our outgoing manager, Bill Shane. We would not be remiss in this moment to, or we would be remiss in this moment. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> not to acknowledge the remarkable contributions of Bill Shane, and we do not say that lightly, who has been an absolute cornerstone of our community. His dedication, leadership, and unwavering commit commitment have helped shape Cumberland to the vibrant, into the vibrant, thriving community it is today, and for this we are forever, forever grateful. From my perspective, Bill has been an invaluable mentor and source of guidance since I joined the council in 2023. His leadership has not only aided me in navigating local governance, but has also inspired me to strive for excellence in serving our community. I am profoundly grateful for the opportunity to have worked alongside such a dedicated and compassionate individual, and I am certain that his legacy of service will continue to resonate within our community for years to come. We recognize that the change of hands will bring its own set of challenge challenges and want to remind everyone that your feedback and input are invaluable as we navigate the transition period. Please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. And finally, I want to thank Angela Hansen from Range Culture for her support and assistance throughout this process. Please join me in congratulating both Bill for an amazing tenure and welcoming Matt to our community. Thank you. I, I will just tell the council that uh, you couldn't have picked a more outstanding candidate. Uh, Matt brings so much to the table. Uh, he is so well respected. Uh, Cape Elizabeth's loss is huge because uh, he's done a great job there over his eight year tenure as manager and uh, I'm excited to see him here in Cumberland. He is such a good person, a man of high integrity well, well respected uh, in Southern Maine and throughout the state, uh, both at the state and, uh, and local level here. And he's got, he got, comes with a good, um, good background. He's a 
a former department head as a, an assessor when we're going through a reval. He's going to be a great help for John Brushwine. Uh, I, congratulations. I was just, just su super overwhelmed and really happy that uh, Matt rose to the top and uh, he was selected and uh, you will not regret it. He's just a good, good person. So I'm really, really happy about that. So thank you for that. It makes my exit much easier and uh, it'll be absolutely seamless. He's a great person and you will be very, very happy with uh, your selection. Um, um, with that, um, we've had a tough couple of days. Um, I would first like to thank um, our Public Works Department, our Fire EMS, and our Police Department for just an outstanding performance in the last three days here. It has been nothing short of just, you know, Ice Storm 2 once again, and it seems like, you know, we're not getting out of this cycle. And uh, um, our first, uh, our first uh, part is trying to keep the roads open, trying to keep our uh, uh, public safety vehicles on the road, and uh, our highway crew did a job second to none. I just am so proud of them and so proud of their commitment. I mean, 30, over 36 hours of plowing and then getting out and jumping with, uh, with side by side with uh, uh, Dan and Chip's crew on uh, chainsaws and moving, moving stuff out of the road. And, uh, and it's just not easy to do when you've been in the, back st in the seat of a truck all day and then the fire and EMS and police jumping from you know, emergency to emergency was just, it's what we do probably best in this community. I would tell you, working as team, the, the three departments work so well when we get into a crisis. And those guys make a crisis just look like an everyday event to them because they're so good. Um, this building is the building of the people of Cumberland and it shall stay open as a warming center until the last power is restored. So. We're open 24 seven, we don't close at six o'clock or eight o'clock, it's, you're here. I was here last night about nine o'clock chatting with a bunch of people, we were trying to figure out the television and all that stuff, but it's been, uh, it's been interesting. I would say we've had about 50 people per day since, uh, since Saturday, since Sunday morning uh, that have been coming in here and mostly to just charge their uh, devices and hang out and get coffee. We had a big coffee crew in here this morning waiting. They, done, they drained the coffee pot in like less than an hour, so I had to go back and refill, but that was great. So it has been fun to see those who've come out uh, to just see what it's all about. Some are just checking out this, uh, the center, but it will always be here. If we're out of power or if we're in a sit state where we've got to provide this as a cooling center, um, the, it's, uh, it works great as a cooling center, doesn't it? It really cools down quick, but uh, <laughs> warming center, not so much. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, for us, it has worked well, and uh, the doors will stay open 24/7 until the last person um, has has their power back, and that has been pretty standard for us for a long time. And I, I'm, I appreciate your support as a council to continue that going forward, and uh, it's uh, I think it's meant a lot to the people in your community. So well done, and thanks for the support there. Uh, right now, I'll turn it back to you so we can get on with the agenda, but. Um, uh, thanks to the crews. Uh, long, long weekend and uh, uh, a lot of missed hours of sleep for many of them. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Manager, and thank you for your leadership on this, too. I really, uh, seeing those posts come out, seeing the texts, the emails about this being open, town hall being open to anyone was really, I think, a calming, a calming message for everyone. So thank you for doing that. Um, Okay, so that concludes manager's report. We are now moving into public discussion. Uh, public discussion is for comments on items that are not on the agenda. Comments are limited to five minutes per person. Rebuttal comments will be limited to two minutes. Public discussion topics may be brought up again under new business for further council discussion. Is there anyone from the public tonight that would like to address the council on an item that's not on the agenda? Please, if you don't mind just stepping up and saying your name and where, yep. you, where you so live. So I'm Melissa Gatine. I'm a resident of Main Street 325. Um, and actually, I'm bringing up something that I know Bill brought last year. That I just want to kind of get it on people's minds again about Brown Tail Moth. Um, last year, I had approached Bill about the idea of looking at lighting on Main Street to reduce moths of being attracted to the Main Street area, and I believe he reached out to the state and found out that that is actually an effective strategy for reducing brown tail moth. I am somebody who is very reactive to it, and um, I don't have any types of trees on my property that host it, but I had a ton of brown tail moths all over the front of my house 
Um, so I would just appreciate it if that's something that could be brought back up and looked at as an option for the town. Um, I'm also going to go to the school board because I know that you guys can't control what the school does with their lights as well. But I'll do that too. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, great. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to address the council on a topic that's not on the agenda tonight? Please. Hi, <clears throat> Denise Thorson from Cumberland. Um, another affordable housing factoid, since I do this now. Um, just if, if anyone hadn't heard, uh, Governor Mills signed LD 337 into law, which amends um, the regulation of manufactured houses to increase affordable housing opportunities. And so this is another thing now available um, main wide that hopefully will be used in our town to increase affordable housing um, within already developed neighborhoods because I, I feel like that's ideal, um, especially with lot splitting, um, being able to place, we've talked about EDUs, but also um, a manufactured house on there to either rent out, help people pay up their mortgages, kind of like a symbiotic relationship, but um, that is a thing now, so not only ADUs, but uh, smaller manufactured housing is now available or able to be <coughs> built on any lot where a single family unit is allowed. So that's freed up things quite a bit. So just keeping that all in our minds is when we're thinking about affordable housing and housing variety in town and building where we can already without having to necessarily put in large developments, which obviously um, based on the referendum is not something that people want. Um, so keeping these other things in mind. So that's the thing now, that's all we got. That's great, thank you, Denise. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to address the council on a topic that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and close public discussion and we will move directly into legislation and policy. The first item on the agenda tonight is 24-021 to hold a public hearing to consider and act on a liquor license application for Fast Track Investments LLC operating at the Cumberland Fairgrounds. Um, it's my understanding this is a new application um, and it's for all different types of uh, Alcoholic beverages, so malt, wine, spirits. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, I did talk to, uh, at your request, I did talk with Lyle Merrifield about this at the fairgrounds. Uh, he was in total support of this application. I also did request that Mike Chinquette come tonight to talk to you directly about uh, exactly what they're going to do. And um, Mike is here and be, be happy to share the how we got here and uh, what, what the plans are because I think they've done a phenomenal job uh, with what they've done at the fairgrounds to date. Lyle was nothing but e effusive in his praise of the operation and, uh, and how things have been going. So Mike, if you wouldn't mind updating the council on how we got here. <laughs> sure, thanks Bill and, and thanks everyone for, uh, for having me tonight. So yeah, Mike Chinquette, I've, I've been here in, in various facets over the years, Finer Jakers over on Wynn Road, as a citizen, uh, former citizen of Cumberland, I, I don't like to admit it, but I did cross the line and reside in Falmouth now. Uh, uh, Mike Eads has already threatened my life, but <laughs> I persevere nevertheless. Uh, but I'm here today as manager of First Tracks, Invest First Tracks Investments, uh, that was a typo on the agenda, I believe, uh, LLC. So as several members of the, uh, of the council know, a few years ago, uh, after the closure of Scarborough Downs, uh, we decided to try to maintain Maine's harness racing heritage and uh, work closely with the Cumberland Farmers Club to uh, bring commercial year-round harness racing uh, to the fairgrounds uh, in addition to the traditional fair meet. Uh, so just to, to give a little bit of flavor of that and then I can discuss about, uh, I can discuss the, the reason for this application this evening. Uh, but over the past three years, uh, we've had significant growth uh, in interest and in uh, what's called handle, so wagering activities on horse racing in Cumberland, Maine. And just to give the council and, and everyone some context of this, a lot of uh, our initiative was focused on what's called simulcast. So sending main racing out around the world uh, for audiences, every legal jurisdiction in the United States, all Canadian provinces. Uh, I think we're in 16 EU countries, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, the Caymans, Jamaica, the Bahamas, all of South America and uh, 
To give you a sense of what the interest is for harness racing in Cumberland, Maine, around the world, last year on 51 race days, over or nearly $7 million were wagered on races in Cumberland, Maine. More than 90% of that's coming from out of state. Uh, so the idea that harness racing is this, uh, you know, will be gone sport that no one cares about anymore is certainly, I believe, not true. Uh, and we've had, like I said, a lot of success over the past couple of years uh, reinvigorating the sport. There's a lot of optimism. Uh, there's a lot of support in Augusta for it. And we're going to keep soldiering ahead. For those who may have been up to the fairgrounds uh, last year or last uh, winter in November and December, you'd see a new uh, giant, essentially big screen TV uh, that's simulcasting all the races. That is our new tote board. And one of the <coughs> things we're very excited about this year is pulling together all six uh, agricultural fairs that conduct racing. So Cumberland Freiburg, Skowhegan, Windsor, Topsom, and Farmington, and consolidating them under a single brand and leveraging everything we've built so far to get Maine racing around the world. Supports Maine's farms, supports uh, you know, all the men and women at the Norton Farm over you know, West Cumberland, West Falmouth that train standard breads, all the boarders, grooms, drivers, owners, farriers, veterinarians, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that you know, support the, the sport and, and support much of Maine's agricultural heritage. So we're really, we're really proud of that. We see, we see fair skies ahead, and we're going to keep forging ahead. That brings us around to tonight's application uh, for uh, folks who've been on the council. There, this has historically been a renewal application. Uh, a gentleman named Matt Mattingly uh, previously uh, held a liquor license for this facility, and he, uh, he's actually since moved to New Hampshire, uh, so he was not going to be continuing that this year. So this application is really just to continue what's historically been done uh, at the fairgrounds for the past several years, during the fair week and, and otherwise, uh, but under our management rather than that. So happy to answer any questions the, the council may have and, and hope for your favorable consideration. Great, thank you, Mike. Any questions? Council? Real quick. Yeah, Mike, I just want to thank you. You've done a great job there and um, you've dealt with some couple neighbors. One in particular wasn't that user friendly, um, but you made it work. Mm -hmm. And um, unless, I, unless you've had complaints, Bill, well, I, I tell you it's been, a great, you, you offer good service up there and uh, we're very proud of your operation. Oh, thank you, we're, we're proud to do it in Cumberland. I just wanted to take this opportunity for an ask to the public. I saw this on Facebook, so I'm gonna extend it to uh, everyone who doesn't follow Facebook. There was an ask that if you are a dog walker on the Cumberland Fairgrounds to keep your dog on a leash. And I think um, Mike has just, articulated why it's so important to keep your dogs. These horses are high-bred sports animals, and um, having dogs running free around while they are training or working or even relaxing is not healthy for them. So just a shout out to the public, if you're walking on the fairgrounds, which they welcome even though it's private property, keep your dogs on a leash. How's that? That's excellent. <laughs> Good reminder. A little PSA. Any uh, comments from the side of the council? I've read, <clears throat> I've read the application. It's complete. I'm ready for a motion. Okay. I, I want to know how you find farriers. It took me four, <laughs> four people till I finally found one. The, the standard bred racing community is a very tight world. So oh. the, uh, they, it's, Jeez. you know, it's, a lot of people they're still, lucky. Yeah, they're very lucky. So, we, but we've got we've got a lot of great horses, and and for anyone you know who's interested, we start back up uh, April twelfth, three fifteen post time. You don't have to buy a ticket. You don't have to buy a, a ticket to wager. It's it's a lot of fun. People of all ages enjoy it. It's it's great main history, and we, we'd love to have you. And those animals are amazing athletes. They are. Any um, before we move to a motion, this is obviously a public discussion. Is there any questions or comments from the public before we? move on this item. Okay. Seeing none, I would happily accept the motion. I move to approve the liquor license application for Fast Track Investments, LLC, operating at the Cumberland Fairgrounds. First track. Second. We have a motion, we have a second, and I believe that second should just be First Track Investment, LLC. Is that tracks plural? Tracks plural. First Tracks Investment, LLC. <coughs> Investments, LLC. Well, we will get that right one time. 
Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion from the council? Nope. Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Missing Councillor Filson. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike, appreciate the comment. Okay, moving on to the next item, 24-022, um, to hold a public hearing to consider and act on a liquor license renewal for Flannel Shirt Food Company, LLC, DBA Dara Bistro. I don't know if we have anyone from Dara here tonight, but this is a what appears to be a pretty standard renewal for a wonderful restaurant in our town that I've frequented many times. Um, I believe the application was complete and there were no issues with it from my review. I don't know if anyone on the council has comments or questions about it. No. Nope. Anyone from the public have any questions or comments on this? Okay. Seeing none, this struck me as pretty standard renewal license, but I'll accept a motion if someone's got one. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you a motion. I move to approve the liquor license renewal for Flannel Shirt Food Company, LLC, doing business as Dara Bistro. A second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Any further discussion or comments? Anyone from the public? Okay, all those in favor? Unanimous. Missing Councillor Filson again. All right, thank you very much. We will now move to the third item on the legislation and policy agenda, 24-023, to hold a public hearing to consider and act on amendments to Chapter 315 Zoning, Section 21, Town Center District, F6, Hours of Operation. Um, before we kind of move into this, I think it's kind of good to maybe level set on where we were and how we got here. Um, a few weeks ago, and other counselors, feel free to jump in if I'm missing any of the facts here. But if, a few weeks ago, um, the folks from Rise Pizza came in and respectfully asked us for, I believe it was three additional hours, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, going from 9 p.m., extending that to 10 p.m., specifically because they had concerns about folks coming out of football games or other school events and kind of this window of time of not being able to sell a certain number of pizzas or the other things that they needed to be able to help their bottom line as a business in town. And I think hearing that and wanting to be favorable and helpful to local businesses in town, us on the council maybe got ahead of our skis and kind of started saying, well, 10 o'clock, maybe 11 o'clock sounds more reasonable. Do you need an extra hour? And I don't personally know any business owner that would say, you know, limit the number of hours that I could possibly work in a town. Um, so I will, I guess, take that on us as a council that maybe we got ahead of what the request was. We've been monitoring what's been discussed online on Facebook and through emails. We're getting quite a few emails for it as well. Um, I know there was also a discussion, and you brought up a great point about Super Bowl Sunday. What do you do on Sundays, right? I mean, maybe we should add Sunday to the mix. And so. I just want to level set to say that I, I don't believe that Toby and others from Rise Pizza were coming in asking for an additional eight hours of four days, additional two hours every single day. I think the council maybe got a little bit ahead of ourselves trying to help um, a local business. And so with that said, I think one of the better approaches here might be to simply table this item to set up an opportunity for the community as a whole to be noticed. And Mr. Manager, I would specifically ask to make sure that anytime there's a zoning change or a discussion of a zoning change, that people are noticed specifically in that area, um, and to probably table this and have us all come back so the community as a whole and the businesses can come back and talk about what's a reasonable approach that maybe meets somewhere in the middle. Because this is a mixed use area, and it is an area that we wanna make sure that we're providing protection for residents who live there, but also at the same time we're making it uh, opportune for businesses to be able to operate and do what they need to do. Um, so I guess with that, I would, okay. please. Go ahead, Councilor Reeve. Uh, Mark, thank you for that. And I, I want to add a little bit more clarification. First off, it, it was not Toby that came to the council. I'm going to make that very clear. He did not come to the council. I was in there doing business. Uh, my wife and I really enjoy that restaurant a lot. Um, it, it is a class A restaurant. Uh, we plan on going m many times. But the point is, I was in there getting gift certificates one day. This is how it all came about. And part of my duties as a counselor is to see how a business is doing. 
And that's what I did. I, st I started the conversation with Toby, and I said, how's it going? What can we as a council do to help your business and help your business be better? What can we do? And one of the things Toby brought up, and legitimately so, was on Friday and Saturday night, we, uh, when a basketball game or a soccer game or a football game is getting out, and parents want to pick up dinner for their kids and want to do I'm locking the doors. I said, well, that, you know, and, and I know it's a small business, and we want to do what we can to help that business. So I said, well, let me take the ball, let me take the ball and run with it. Not Toby, me. So my original idea was, to, I, I mentioned it at the council meeting, and I said, it doesn't make any sense that when all these people and their Cumberland residents are coming out, they can't get any food that time of night. It's crazy. Um, and we had a discussion, and we said, we'll bring it to the um, ordinance committee, which I'm part of. We discussed it, and we made the recommendation um, for Friday, Saturday night to bring it, to bring it back. And we had an 11 o'clock cap on it. We got in discussions, and I agree with you, Mark, we got ahead of ourselves on it. You know, we wanted to, instead of 10 o'clock, we wanted, we wanted to give it 11 o'clock. And then it was going to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, I, I believe there's a good compromise here. I, I want Toby to capture all that business he can. He's, it, he runs a Class A business, and I want to keep it going. Um, but I do want to make sure that, especially the people that are here tonight, I brought it forward, not him. And I'm glad I did. I fully support it. I will continue to support it. But he should not take the blame. Um, for this being brought, it's me. Yep. So I just want to make sure that's clarified. Yep. Appreciate that. Yeah. Anyone else on the council? Councilor Bill. I'm not sure that I would uh, would move to table this. I might be more inclined to move to deny the request, uh, and for for two reasons. Um, we are getting ready to um, implement a comprehensive plan committee, and I would <clears> think that this would be one of the things that would come under that. Uh, review of, of ordinances and, and what goes on. And, and we certainly found that there was a lack of uh, protocol, if you will, in how we notify people for uh, change of zoning. And the fact is that there was no mechanism in place to notify the abutters. Uh, so that would certainly be something that would either the ordinance committee would come back with. But I, I think in this case, the. The bigger, the bigger picture is the, the new comprehensive plan committee taking a look at this. Um, the other thing that, uh, and I attended the planning board meeting and I watched the comments, and um, uh, certainly there was enough comments made that uh, uh, Toby needs to reach out to his neighbors and make sure that uh, when you ask for something, you you have a good understanding that your neighbors are going to support you and. Certainly, my feeling was coming away from this that, that almost universal, there was um, at least all the close neighbors had some sort of complaint about noise and lighting and, and things like that. So, and if I look at the, the, um, the email trail that uh, precluded that, there again was some, some instances of uh, lighting and uh, it was addressed and things like that. But so, um, I'm really more inclined to. to deny the request, and then go back to uh, either the audits committee to, to look at that. But I think specifically, I think the comprehensive plan uh, is, the, is the next step that the council will be doing uh, uh, probably this summer coming up with a committee or appointing a committee for that. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's the track that I would take. Uh, however, if the council feels that a tabling motion is, is more uh, in line, I would support that too. So that's my thoughts. Thoughts on that? I'll, I'll just add, oh, go ahead. I, I just want everybody to know that when this came up, it was brought up only Friday and Saturday night, and it was called weekend business. And I think I am the guy that is guilty of saying Sunday is part of the weekend, which in my mind, if you watch the Super Bowl, it's on Sunday. If you watch NASCAR race and it's on Sunday, this is typically what people go to restaurants and bars to watch. So it was not brought up by the owner of the restaurant 
to the open on Sunday. It was brought up by me, which made, only made sense because it was a weekend. Yep. Just want to make that clear. Yeah, I think that just further supports the fact, and again, the message we're trying to get out to everyone is the folks from RISE were not asking, in my view, for something unreasonable. I think we, we came out and pushed it a little bit further than maybe what the request was. So hopefully that level sets a little bit as to where that's coming from, because we all live in the same community. We want to make sure that folks are, folks are on the same page with that. My only comment, I, I totally agree on the um, comprehensive plan side of things, but my concern is that the timing of that and how long that takes. And I want to make sure we're addressing a need of a business earlier than that if we can, um, because a business might not have a year or two to wait for a committee to form and look at these issues, and I think we can do them simultaneously at the same time, and so that's something I want to make sure we're, we're taking into consideration. So for me, a table would be appropriate. I know we've got folks who are here this evening who have comments. I want to make sure we're addressing the, any comments that we have to the specific request, not to concerns about lighting or noise or pollution because I don't think we're at that point yet. I think th those are all valid. I'm not saying they're not. I just want to make sure we, we understand the scope in which those are being tested or uh, maybe a concern. So. Um, so if we table and we second, we don't get public correct. input. Can I, um, yeah, so we, if we make a motion tonight right now, we can go right to a straight vote and table and. Correct. So I'll make a motion. It's already been made. Bob already made it. I have not okay. made a motion. I've not made a motion but, yet. Uh, before you make a motion, I, and particularly if you move to table, table will eliminate any opportunity for the public to, to give their thoughts. So uh, Even before we vote on it? If you make the motion, that's... Once the motion is made to table, discussion ends. So I, I would, and I so would ask you I'm not saying that. I don't want to hear public discussion, but I'm just wondering if this is the appropriate venue to do it. If we don't, as a council, plan on moving this forward this evening, it almost seems like we need to keep our powder dry, all of us collectively, to try to figure out what those comments are that we have in the appropriate venue so we can come out of that venue with something that's <clears> workable <throat> as opposed to just, I don't know if anyone here this evening has the desire to move Well, I just wanted to also Please. Yep. highlight four of us were there at the planning board meeting and their recommendation was ought not to pass. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure everyone knows that that was their recommendation. Yep. And I'm always a, somewhat uncomfortable going against our yep. committee's recommendations. Mr. Manager. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think... <laughs> The entire process has been kind of gotten away from us. And I, I honestly believe you have a mixed use district here that uh, almost deserves a reset. Uh, the zoning violations uh, that were brought up at the planning board meeting, those will be those will be dealt with. Those are still violations regardless. So if there's lighting issues, we'll deal with that through the code office. If there's noise issues, we'll deal with that through the code office. I, we don't need to go through that, what we went through with the planning board. We really, we're really focusing on the hours of operation. And I think our big miss, honestly, was a surprise to me that the district wasn't noticed. Typically, a zoning change would initiate a call to, or at least a postcard to the everybody in that district. But because it was a recommendation, not a actual change at the planning board, uh, uh, the uh, town planner was advised through the town attorney that uh, no notice was required because the action would take place here tonight. Um, I disagree with that, as do you, as do probably all the council. We really should notify people when we're doing something like this. If it wasn't for Carla, most of the folks here would have never even known it was on the planning board agenda. So she had made some calls during the day and said, hey, we are bad, but here's what's happening. And they came and they testified. So. I honestly feel a reset, basically having us all sit at tables here, uh, like we do with most neighborhood meetings, hearing the issues so people can talk and they don't have to go up to a mic and a timer and all that stuff. I think that's a better way to move forward and a better way to at least hear it. And at least you'll hear what their concerns are. Toby will hear it across the table, not at a microphone. Uh, the neighbors will hear the responses. We'll have more information for you before that meeting such as you know when the when are the lights going off has the timer been checked are we checking the noise all of those things can be addressed pretty quickly and 
uh, Toby has been very responsive when uh, he and I have met on several occasions. And I've said, no, these lights are not the right lights. He changed them almost within two days. So for me, I think he has done what we've asked him to do, but we will go back and check it to see if there is any light trespass, to see if there are noise issues. I measured with a decibel meter the other day the ventilation fan. It was in compliance with our with the number on our ordinance. So there are little things we can do pretty easily and to set those aside and then find out specifically what are the real issues that neighbors are having. And if they are real, we'll address them. And we can address them, as you heard through the police department tonight, pretty easily with just a kind of a swing through the parking lot sometimes. And uh, we do business checks. We do things like uh, we can come up and work with Toby on that if we're having some issues with uh, disorderly patient, uh, patrons. That's not good for anybody. It's not good for his business. It's not good for the town or the neighbors. So those things can be addressed easily. So I'm hopeful that we can get together and just sit around the tables and not uh, not you know debate this at the uh, at the right. mic. And I think much. that's complicated. I'll be part of my motion if if you let me if you want to hear it. Absolutely. Any other comments before then? We, we noticed this as a public hearing. Uh, and I think that if, if there are an opportunities to hear something new, like you said, Shirley, four of us were at the planning board meeting. And I think we heard the concerns by, the, by all the abutters. Uh, but if there was, uh, and I'll leave that discretion to you whether to go right to the motion or to open it for limited my my con my only concern with opening it up now to the microphone is an additional hour or two of similar comments perhaps that were raised at the at the planning board Ex which i'm not saying are not valid comments or concerns i'm I saying I, I think the better yeah. venue for them is in a is in an environment in which we can come out of it with a viable compromise not here where we will hear them and say we're not going to move forward with this because a the planning board said don't move forward with it and there's 20 individuals who have concerns about it i think a better venue is a conversation as the town manager brought up so just to be very clear it's not trying to stuff stifle public comment it's trying to make sure it's being used in the most productive manner in the most productive space so my proposal would be to table move this towards some type of community meeting in the short term where we can have this discussion <coughs> openly and my apologies in in advance for wasting anyone's time and toby if i open you up for comment i feel the need to i feel that no this is not open for question right now because if i do then i'm i feel the need to open it up to everyone for every comment so i'll, I'll make the motion Councilor reads yes I move to table this item and to move to hold a neighborhood meeting to discuss the concerns of the neighbors to see if a compromise can be found. Second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor of tabling? Okay, unanimous. Oh, excuse me, we have one, no, I'm, one opposed or? No, I'm with, I'm with okay. it. I just know these people came out. I know. I'm trying to respect their time. I, I am also trying to respect their time by letting them leave a little bit earlier um, and hopefully bring some of those comments with them. So do we have an idea, Mr. Manager, on when? Within the next two to three weeks, but we'll be looking at school vacations too, so we'll try to be respectful of that. <clears throat> yeah. so, thank you. Not during the solar eclipse. <laughs> Not, Not eclipse, eh? <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming, and our apologies for <coughs> wasting everyone's time here. But hopefully this is more productive. Thank you. I'm on the Canadian board watching the direct line. Okay, we are moving on to the next item on the agenda, 24-024, <laughs> to set, a, set the week of May 13th through the 17th for spring bulky item pickup week. Uh, Mr. Manager, if I'm not mistaken, is this our final... <laughs> This is it. Bulky Show item. of shows. Get it all out. Can't wait. Get it out. This is it. Dump the garage onto the curb. It's going to be a very long week. Time for me. I got to pick so, up everybody's junk. As folks are leaving, there may be some background noise here, but um, for folks at home who are listening, just a reminder that we have switched over um, our 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 waste disposal service provider, and based on that new contract, bulky item pickups, which has kind of been a staple of our community every twice a year. 
uh, will no longer be available. And so this will be the last bulky item pickup uh, week that we have. Again, that's May 13th through the 17th. So Start cleaning out your garages and attics now. Get in there. Just recycling week. Off. Recycling week will be the week before. So anything that's kind of valuable, <laughs> you think really good stuff, call get it out shame. the week before. Right? Oh, <laughs> Taking whole cash. <laughs> no, no cars. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from the council on this before I open it up to the public for questions on this? Just, just make sure everybody reads the list to correct. see what's acceptable. Yes, yes, big bags of clothing shocked. are not. You'd be bulky shocked waste. that your TV sits out there for two weeks. Well. Yeah. <laughs> and the refrigerator. Exactly. And, and your air conditioner. Right. <laughs> and a reminder that people can still take their bulky waste and refrigerator and air conditioners and other things like that. And even if you've got an old cast iron stove, you might even get money for it if you take it to Riverside Recycling. So just. 40 bucks for a refrigerator. You got 40, 40 bucks for a stove? Cost $40 to, to dispose to of it. To get rid of? Cost 40 bucks. 40 bucks. <laughs> okay. A cast iron wood stove that they can recycle the iron? You'd be surprised metal. how little They you have get a good metal recycling. Schnitzes will pay you for iron. So. Yeah. <laughs> so the list of what you cannot um, discard and what you can discard will be pumped out through the crier and put on the Cumberland's Facebook page and uh, weekly. Is in our, weekly and is in our council packet this evening. So any um, questions from the public, comments from the public on this? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor to set that week? We've got a motion from council. Oh, excuse me, I think we, do we need a motion first? I'll give you one. Okay, please, Council Cowell. <laughs> I move to set the week of May 13th through the 17th for spring bulky item pickup week. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Cannot wait for that week. Uh, the last item on the agenda tonight is to hear a report from the town manager regarding the public safety radio communication project, which is 24-025. Mr. Manager. Uh, just briefly, because we really want to see uh, if we can uh, muster some of your support tonight because we've had a very, very difficult time with this project. Uh, as you will recall, we were all educated in radio communications around the table here just about a year ago that no one of us, none of us understood. Uh, our expert came in and explained why we want to look at a microwave project um, <coughs> for radio uh, cell towers. Right now, we have uh, three of those towers. We're missing two. Uh, the two towers that we, myself and the chief primarily, have been working on were going to be through uh, an outside vendor, and th that vendor would basically build the tower, pay us a fee for the uh, lot rental, essentially, and we would co-locate on that tower with that uh, uh, company, regardless of who it is, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, whoever, but somebody would come. We uh, went out for RFP. We received one RFP uh, really at the 11th and a half hour. That person agreed to build a tower, and uh, we, we thought we were off and running. Shortly after that, uh, both vendors, the one on Range Way as well as the one on in West Cumberland, uh, withdrew from the project and left us with no project, essentially. So we scrambled and asked our uh, radio consultant, who has nothing to do with these towers, totally independent, uh, what would be our next steps? And he would he suggested that we consider uh, building the towers and then going after a third party to uh, jump on the tower and then they would pay us a fee. Um, obviously, that's a risk. It's a risk, especially since we've had two vendors walk away from this. Uh, but we also have a need for public safety. And uh, what uh, I'll let the chief explain the issues we're having with public safety and the radio communications that we presently have. But the risk is substantial in cost. Um, we estimated a $2 million project when we started this. It'll go to $2.7 million if we have to build both towers. So it's an additional $350,000 per tower uh, to push this forward. Uh, the offset to that would be revenues generated that we would hope to achieve by attracting a, a vendor because they didn't, they, we could go through the planning board process uh, get the approvals and then get the towers built through a separate vendor and then 
most of that work would be done and they wouldn't have to do it, which would seem attractive, but there's no guarantee. So before we get too far down this road, um, this will come up again in your TIF budget discussions through the budget. So I just want to kind of kind of set the table that we're not where we would hope to be today. Actually, we had hoped to be at the planning board last November with one of the towers on Rangeway when the uh, gentleman pulled out at the last minute. Uh, right now, uh, Chief, if you wouldn't mind giving the council just an update of the specific pro uh, problems we're having with radio communication, uh, and this is public safety. This isn't just police, this is fire EMS as well. So that would be helpful just to kind of remind them where we started and then we can decide what's what's next. Sure, thank you. Um, so hard to believe I got hired here as chief June of 2016, almost eight years ago. And just before I started, I came to the PD to uh, meet some of the staff and take a tour and take a ride around town and I met some of the employees. And literally when I walked in and they found out I was the new chief, they stuck their hand out and said, nice to meet you, when can you fix our radios? So fast forward eight years later and we're still talking about this. Um, I consider it to be a great failure of mine that I haven't figured out how to give our police, fire and EMS radio communications from their mobiles in their cruisers and their fire trucks and their portables which sit on their hips while they're out and about in town. There's coverage maps, I think they may be up on our website, we can get them to you if you need to see them, but there are locations in this town where our police officers and our firefighters cannot hear dispatch and where dispatch cannot hear our firefighters and our police when they're out on calls. That is a danger to those public safety personnel, potentially to the members of the public that they serve, and it has been a very persistent problem that we've been unable to solve, primarily because it's a pretty big price tag to get it fixed. I wish it wasn't. Uh, Bill and I were flying high and, and Chief Small when we thought we had found private money to come and build these two towers, and then our house of cards just collapsed on us. So. Um, I can go into a little bit more detail. I asked Sergeant Ridge to be here. He spends a lot more time out on the road than I do if you have specific questions, but that's the overall picture. There are spots in town where we can't talk to dispatch, dispatch can't hear us, and it's a public safety risk. Eventually somebody's gonna get hurt, and that's on us. We need to, we need to try to figure out how to fix it. Um, we, we made a huge stride when we were able to hire um, our engineer with a grant that we got from uh, the federal government and at least start figuring out what a new system would look like and starting to get some preliminary budgetary numbers. We won't know actually what they are until we go out to bid to see what the market's going to tell us that, that this all costs. And so, um, I don't know, Bill, if that's a decent explanation or if I missed well, the mark. Well, just bring us up to date too on where we are with Shabig Island and, your, and the town of Yarmouth as well because that, that has become almost a regional project with everybody participating. So that's worked real well too. Right, yes, um, thank you. So we've been working with Shabig and with the town of Yarmouth on a project to um, get, right now we have a bunch of our radio equipment, the fire department has a bunch of the radio equipment inside the Shabig fire department. It's basically in like a mop closet inside the fire department. Uh, and to get that equipment out of the building and into a standalone structure and then, um, and then work together to get our equipment combined on some, some uh, joint antennas that we would all be on so that the amount of equipment that's up on that tower uh, doesn't overload the tower. So Shabig has been a really great partner. Yarmouth has been a really great partner. We've all worked together with our engineer to, to try to get this sort of, I think, regional project um, up and running. That's part of the backbone that we're hoping to build through the town of Cumberland and it's kind of wonky uh, geography that it has that requires us to have something on Chabig, something somewhere around Rangeway, somewhere on, over on Valhalla, an existing tower, and then out in West Cumberland. And we're hoping that uh, shortly we'll be bringing an MOU back to the council for that joint cooperation with Yarmouth, Shabig Island, and the town of Cumberland. Uh, it would be sharing in future generators, it would be sharing in future buildings. This is a prefab building, uh, We like, like you see out back, the Hillview Barn style where all we need is a wall, so it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be almost prefab before it even goes to the island, and then most of the work there is really uh, pretty simple. So. Uh, this has been a pretty good project. Shabig Island has been a great partner and uh, has been uh, really helpful. Uh, the, uh, Chief Monroe, who many of you know, Ralph Monroe, good, good person to work with, uh, he's been great. Uh, uh, and I think this just shows you we've got still good collaboration going on, except 
we just can't find uh, basically people to work on these towers. I think we've tried everything from voter systems where they're like portable base stations in, in the back of these cruisers to get their radio signal out to these voter systems. Doesn't work. And the maps that uh, Norm brought us when we were sitting around the tables here kind of showed you those gaps in coverage all around the town. Those would be eliminated uh, with these two additional towers. So I, I don't know if um, this will come up again when we go through the TIF budget, but I just want to kind of plant the seed to start thinking about that. Um, Chief Rumsey has been uh, back and forth with, uh, is it US Cellular or T-Mobile? One of those vendors that had, again, expressed an interest because uh, we are, we know we have to permit the rangeway site on town land, so we're moving forward with that at the planning board, and we're hoping that just getting through that planning board might get some excitement going. Uh, we're also trying to redesign that. They, they brought a large, large road in that went, I don't know, seven or 800 feet back because of a setback issue with a potential vernal pool, and we're, we're dealing with that this spring. <coughs> See if we can shorten that up and basically pull it forward and really reduce those costs. So we're doing our part to try to encourage a dance partner to come with us, and if we can get that and get them to build the tower and get us on it, that'll be huge. That'll be one of the two. The second one we're having a hard time with is in uh, West Cumberland. Uh, one, locating a, 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 a place to put this, and uh, two, getting somebody to build it. And that that's, unfortunately, that may be the one we have to build and then pursue vendors to basically locate on that tower. You know, if I could just add to that, uh, Bill, what, what we were told when we had our House of Cards built that we had a private company that responded to our RFP that was preparing to build a tower on the west side of town they were going to build a tower on town land and then find a, um, a tenant to come and rent space on the tower and then a, a cell company that was going to actually build a tower for us on rangeway and allow our public safety equipment in there and that all collapsed because of um, sort of a general malaise in the telecom market is what they told us like things things just took a turn that there had been billions of dollars spent in trying to build up 5g and then their business model is expand and contract, expand and contract. And we actually were just about to cross the finish line and get a land use agreement signed for Rangeway. Had it been signed, they would have been locked in. They would have had to go forward. We probably missed that by 30 days, maybe. So, so what they're saying is that eventually the market will turn and these cell companies, all of them, are going to need space on more towers. We just don't know if that's six months from now, a year from now, 18 months from now. My fear is that if we take the position we're, we're going to wait until the market turns, then the officers and, and firefighters and EMTs we send out in the community, they're still just hanging out there without the support that they really need to be safe. So that's, that's just my fear that we'll be 10 years instead of eight that we haven't really tackled this problem. Random question, Bill. Is there a tower in the congregational church steeple? Yes. Yes. Is that like an approach we could take? I don't know if this solves any of this problem, but in the West Cumberland Community Center, could we put something comparable? Uh, we, we had a, a tower on that lot at, that would have been located on that lot on, a, on like a 50 by 50 swath. Yeah, uh, I feel like we talked about that. We tried to go off site a little bit just so we wouldn't impact the recreational space out there, and yeah. that has not been successful. We may end up back there. Okay. It doesn't have necessarily the height. You know, the nice thing about what I understand the, the uh, cell equipment that's in the church is it's hidden inside the yeah. steeple. Right. I don't think there's a building of the necessary elevation out on the west side, so it would be a tower. Yeah. Okay. Oh, My question, I just had a quick question. You don't, didn't get the sense that technology's changing, that that might be what their reluctance was about, or because I hear about, like, you know, different kinds of cellular phones, especially when we had the power outage. I, I got nothing. I couldn't even make a call out. Mm. Um, no, nothing that has been mentioned to us. The, um, the two gentlemen that we spoke with that we were working with on the east side and the west side both said, we've been doing this for many years. This is what we see. It, expand, it contracts. It expands. Uh, and, and sometimes those people okay. that we've been talking to have been getting laid off just because of the way that the, the market is going. But they think it'll come back. The, the, the big question, the million-dollar question literally is when does that happen? Okay. Yeah. Chief um, or Tony, is Blackstrap 
uh, the Blackstrap Towers, are they available for us? Are they a consideration? I know the state police has a couple of repeaters on there. Um, it's a high, but I would almost think it would look down on West Cumberland. The answer to that question is I don't know off the top of my head. I feel like it may have been, or this, is, this has been going on for several years now. I do know, uh, I do, I believe I'm accurate in remembering that it's very extremely expensive <laughs> to be on there, but expensive compared to laying out half a million dollars to build a tower. I can certainly get an answer for you on that. Great. Thanks, Chief. Sure. Yeah. Just a comment, Bill, on if the town did pursue putting up a tower up there, I mean, I can take you around town and tell you where my cell phone goes dead, the bottom of the hill by the fairgrounds, the bottom of the hill by the board barn, just beyond the railroad tracks here. I mean, there's a whole host of issues. My question is, and maybe Mike, you can add to this, the main turnpike dispatches out of their new center out by the mall, they call me all hours of the night. And the state police actually have trouble on certain places on the turnpike with radio communication. It might be worth reaching out to them just to say, hey, can we partner with you? I mean, because, I mean, I, I interact with those guys all of the time. And I mean, I'll see Tony out beside the road with his portable like this. I mean, I don't think he's waving to me. He's trying to get reception. I mean, and I do, Tony. I mean, it's not a joke. A lot of times there'll be an accident at the intersection, and you'll see one of the town cops out here like this trying to get reception. And like the chief says, something serious is going to happen if this isn't taken care of. So. That's a good suggestion too, Ron, because I, if it's happening on the turnpike, I know it's happening on 295. Oh, absolutely, Shirley. I mean, down in the ledges as yeah. well. I mean, there, there are all kinds of dead zones. You guys yeah. know. I mean, you deal with this daily, but it might be worth reaching out to the turnpike authority just to say, hey, we're looking at this. Bill, I, it's probably far-fetched. I try to stay in somewhat of a small lane. <laughs> Why? But if we're looking at a water tower at some point. <laughs> Could we combine a water tower with something to hook, um, to put a tower on? Uh, that's a great, great question. Excuse and me, really, I didn't hear that. Really, Did great question. <laughs> great question. Wrong location, but the great question. Uh, yeah, we did. We talked to Norm about that uh, because we're looking at Bruce Hill Road and we're looking at that elevation. That elevation will be around uh, 406, 407. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we want to be out in West Cumberland is definitely in that 406, 407 range. So uh, we can ask Norm about that. Uh, but uh, for us, the microwave model that they built, um, really the issues were closer toward West Cumberland. And that is going to be on the, at the end of Bruce Hill Road on, on top of Blueberry Hill. So we thought we were all cured with the FAA tower. And that's not really been the answer. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at somewhere that we can get with a technically 190 foot tower, uh, it's less than 200, uh, somewhere around elevation 400 plus. So thank you. Councilor Cal. Just one more comment. And if we do reach out with the main turnpike authority, they actually have a pump for the water out on by the rest area, not the rest area, but the just before Blackstrap northbound on the turnpike, there's a pull out there. Yeah. Just to the right of that, there is a small building out there, which I believe holds some type of a pump that's owned by the main turnpike, and that's almost exactly the same elevation as the land we were looking at, and the main turnpike authority owns that land. I know what you're referencing. <clears throat> Are we talking about the, that real wide-out area on the turnpike? Yeah, but between that and the ball fields, Bill, there's a yes. small building yeah. there that the yes. main turnpike authority yeah. owns. That might be a perfect location for a tower, they own the land. They might be willing to partner on something. So, Great idea. Yep. Councillor Kopp, when you mentioned the dead zones <clears throat> by the board barn and then um, down south on Route 100, yeah. that was why that West Cumberland site got selected, right. because it would close a bunch of those dead zones in there, and why the um, company that bid on that RFP to build a tower, why they thought a cellular company would go up. Oh, you mentioned... Um, past the fairgrounds, so I drive there twice a day, and if I'm on the, if I'm on a call, I will pretty reliably lose it somewhere around the intersection of exactly. Skillen Road and, uh, and Blanchard. And when they looked at what they get for coverage on a tower, they thought that would probably mm -hmm. help. So I was actually excited about that for a couple of reasons, that we would get better 
coverage on our radios and that maybe I could talk on the phone in the middle of Cumberland while I'm driving. And your office hands -free. won't look like yeah. the Statue of Liberty on there. But. Yeah, we call it the Statue of Liberty pose, <laughs> which you're right, it's not, it's not funny, but it has a name, which is yeah. sad, you know. <laughs> um, I just a sidebar comment. Uh, the Two Hands Farm, which is in that dead zone that you were referencing, I've been over there a couple times, and it says if you can't, you probably can't complete your Venmo payment because you have no cell service here. It's okay if you pay us after you leave. That's how bad the cell mm. service is in that area. Not surprising. Uh, so <coughs> people can't even operate a business here. Yeah. And and you know a, a public safety related point when we have the Cumberland Fair every fall, that's a dead zone for our radios and for our cell phones. And so the last uh, well last year, last two years, we actually got AT and T for those phones that are on FirstNet to haul in a mobile um, unit that's called a that. cellular over light truck. Yeah. That helps those of us that have AT&T FirstNet, not everybody does, with cell coverage in the fairgrounds. Uh, but that's a pretty gigantic gathering of human beings to not have reliable communications for an emergency that might arise. And so we're hopeful that maybe we can make some progress on this and make that all a little bit better. Yeah, Chief, thank you again for reminding us about that. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll hear more about this during the uh, budget presentation TIF when portion. we're talking about TIFs because uh, remember when we signed TIF 8, uh, the telecommunications tower was one of the projects we yep. added to it. Yep, I remember that. Okay, well, thank you, Chief. I don't think there's any action on this item tonight, so um, thank you for the presentation. So that concludes legislation and policy this evening. We will now move uh, to new business, and I will go ahead and start at my left with Councilor Cobb. I'd like to donate my $20 to the food pantry. And about a week or so, Mike Eads notarized something for a gentleman, <laughs> and he, Mike wouldn't take any money, but the guy insisted. He handed Mike a $5 bill, and Mike asked me to donate this to the food pantry. So Mike, there's your $5. Yeah, thanks. And now everybody in town is going to want to know that you're going to notarize something for them. So. Five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are the things that come up in our audit every year. Like, uh, <laughs> cash for pay and I have a couple other things. Um, people in town are asking me, Bill, if you know anything about what's going on in the building beside Casco Systems. There has been some people over there in the last week carrying off building products with pickups, different all kinds of different people, just stuff disappearing. So, yeah, so what So what we've heard internally uh, from mm -hmm. uh, the finance group that has basically taken over the project is they have told uh, Bill Longley that their intention is to build it out. Uh, we questioned whether they might want to send a structural engineering team first out to see if what was built could be built out because some of the construction was I, I suspect. Let's just leave it at that. But... Uh, they didn't have any fear. They said they've done this before. Uh, the problem we have is timing. We just don't know when this is going to be done. I believe that uh, the, the, the project uh, manager did get an extension from the planning board to continue. So what I will get back to you is when that, uh, when that expires and uh, when it basically has to start all over again. We are holding bond money if we have to go in and clean it up. We have enough money to basically level it and clean it. I hope we don't get to that phase. I hope somebody does go in and build a building there. Uh, but we've also had requests that uh, the first request they came out of was uh, building apartments. And I said, we don't have any zoning that allows that right now. So uh, that you can build the commercial buildings, and that's all that's allowed. Uh, and uh, that's where it was left. And they said, OK, uh, we will get back to you. But we haven't heard anything in probably a month now. Thank you. And the last thing I have, we have a very special resident that resides in this town of Cumberland by the name of Julia Gagnon. If anybody watched American Idol last night, it was absolutely a heart-wrenching story and what a wonderful job she did. And I just think it's upon us, the council, to recognize her. And I don't know if anybody can see this picture or not, but she did an absolute phenomenal job last night and it, I mean, this community should be very proud of what we raised. I mean, it, the whole story is just phenomenal. I mean, I mean, it's just a great thing, so. Where did you get that? Uh, this was in the, the Press Herald. The Press Herald. And okay. I will give it to anybody. And I actually am gonna reach out to Lyle Merrifield, who is the president of the Farmers Club, 
if they could get this young lady to come perform at the Cumberland Fairgrounds, it would absolutely be awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a great, great story. And I'll let anybody that wants, they can have this because I have another copy home. It's just a fantastic Ronnie, story. Ronnie, she's saying a uh, Aretha Franklin song. Uh, yeah. That was, I mean, when you can make Lyle Ritchie yeah. uh, get emotional. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it, it was stunning. The three judges on that, they gave her the golden ticket to say that she was moving on. And then they said, wait a minute, we're going out and take that ticket back. And they gave her a platinum ticket, which I guess puts her ahead of Let's everybody else. Skip a step. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. I mean, and they couldn't say enough good about her. And here we are, this young girl from Cumberland, Maine. I mean, it really makes you feel proud. So it's, and it's quite a story, so. That's great. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That's great. Oh, very cool. That's all I have. Great. Councilor Vail. I'm with the uh, town manager of the Public Works, Fire Department, Police Department, all uh, get accolades for the uh, work that was put in this weekend. The ones who don't get the accolades are the neighbors who had branches down in their yards out into the roadways. And I'm just astounded. And it wasn't just in Cumberland. I saw it all over. If, if you have a branch that goes down in front of your house, it's in the roadway, get up and pull it out of the roadway. Just, uh, you know, I, I understand trees and big stuff like that. You, you can't expect somebody to do that. But uh, I saw a lot of debris that uh, homeowners could easily have cleaned up and uh, get out of the roadway. Uh, anyways. Uh, and the brush dump is open now, so there you go. Uh, they time. didn't have to take it to the brush dump. They just needed to get out of the road. And, and as to the selection of our new manager, he's got big shoes to fill. He does. Thank you, Councilor Bell. Councilor Douglas. Quick question. Uh, don't we have a budget meeting on Saturday? Uh, no. Uh, we, we went to tele while you were gone, uh, we basically went to televising the budget meetings now. And we never did that in the past. Okay. So the Saturday meeting was postponed and, and basically continued. Oh my it gosh, continued. that's amazing. I know. That's all I got. Yeah. Councilor Eads. I have nothing other than to wish my wife happy birthday. So hey, that's great. Oh. That made the cut. I like it. Yeah, she, you're uh, married, Mike. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Thirty-four <laughs> years together. She's put up me. I what? say, I say, this is her birthday present every day. But she could do better. <laughs> <laughs> like, where's the real one? That's great, Mike. Happy birthday to your wife. Councilor. Uh, just two things. Um, one is a reminder that we had. When Mike Schwint was last presenting to us, we were discussing a conservation easement on Twin Brooks. Um, that's something I'd like to look at. It's on my sort of checklist before I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> my to do list. And my, I think we've got what, four more meetings left, Ron, something like that, um, just to get that process started. It makes me nervous when we hear people out in the community going, oh, well, let's just put a new school at Twin Brooks. And it, that kind of raises my um, hairs on the back of my neck a little bit because um, that's not what the community purchased it for. And the other thing, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, well, probably by, it was just before 4 when it finished, uh, Anna DeWolf and the Notre Dame Fighting Irish won a spot in the Sweet 16. Beautiful. They great. will be playing in the NCAA championship Sweet 16 game, I think, on Friday. It's this coming weekend. I think they play Friday. But they easily beat Ole Miss today by 15, 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 points. That's really awesome. Yeah, very cool. Because you look at Anna, and she's not – I mean, she's – you would not peg her as an NCAA – all-star or whatever and she's just a phenomenal player she can move the ball she can move the ball she can pass like no one i know so and she can score i mean she's she's consistently up around 12 points a game somewhere yeah. around there yep so good luck anna and the irish and that's all i have that's great thank you Unlike my uh, Nebraska Cornhuskers, who made it to the tournament and once again are the lar I think the only team from a major conference that is still yet to win an NCAA first round game. <laughs> and my son asked me, he goes, "Well, how long have they had a basketball team?" I said, "Only since 1896." So it's, uh, awkward. We're, we're struggling. Yeah, still it's not time. great. Still yeah, time. still time. 
Um, the only thing I have is just a reminder on the budget workshops that you just brought up that we do have uh, budget workshops on April 8th and then also on April 22nd. And then on May 13th, the town manager will be doing a, a uh, budget presentation and then hopefully we'll have a budget adoption uh, that night as well. But I'll turn it over to you if you've got uh, a Just quickly, um, thank you, uh, Shirley, for all the comments you've submitted so far. But please don't hesitate to send any comments you have as you go through the budget. It's really helpful for us to prepare for these meetings. Uh, before you tonight, you also have some documents related to the budget to show you the 10,000 foot view, to show you there's a lot of support information behind it, but it's really the first two or three pages to look at. It's the two pie, sh pie shapes there in front of you. It shows the wages and benefits and then all the other categories we have in the budget. So uh, kind of where we started last year, just to give you a, a, an idea of where the increases were. And just remember the number, every $150,000 is 10 cents. So I know it's, it's tempting to jump right to, you know, fixing problems, but we've got to fi figure out a way to fix them in a deliberate manner. And I think we will get some attention this time because it is every town is going through the same thing, especially with fire EMS. So let's hope we can get some, some at least future um, movement on, even if it's going out for equipment, even if it's sharing equipment, even if it's you know putting a pool of people together, all of those things are come forward. So I've, I just ask that you, you know, consider maybe that uh, we take some stronger action than just waiting for the next budget meeting, that you think about other ways, maybe collectively with getting together with other councils that might be you know, something we did before COVID. We did it pretty regularly. And even if it's GP COG to facilitate that, we can get Christina Egan back and, you know, talk about this along with other things because it's not just fire EMS, it's right across the board. So, you know, the sooner we start it, the better, I think. Okay. Dr. Bill. To, to follow up on that, Bill and I met with the uh, Falmouth Town <coughs> Manager and uh, one of the counselors there past Tuesday, right? Thursday. Tuesday, whatever. Uh, and anyways, the, the, out of that meeting was an understanding that Bill and the Falmouth uh, Nate uh, would come out of it with a letter of understanding or something. Uh, hopefully to present a council resolution council by resolution. both towns that we basically direct the managers to start working together immediately, especially on the fire EMS side to see if there are collaborations we can do effectively and how do we get to a place where we can help each other. And this is that agreement I was telling you that's a kind of more than just mutual aid. It's, it's that next level that we're going to respond to you if you're ready to help us. We're not ready to help anybody just yet, but we'll get there eventually and uh, it would be good if uh, in the interim we could start building these relationships that, that are meaningful. And I think Falmouth is a good partner. I believe Yarmouth, North Yarmouth would be good partners as well, but we all got to bring something to the table and you know, we're, we're barely covering our own Right. We, we talked about uh, collaboration, so we, we do have a joint standing committee between Cumberland and North Yarmouth, but I think from the vibrations that I felt from Falmouth that they would be just as happy to form a committee with Cumberland and Falmouth going forward. So I think Great. that uh, the ball's in our court, court now to follow up with that. Okay. And to follow, <coughs> just to kind of close the loop on that, these memorandums of understanding and these agreements of, you know, sharing back and forth and in terms of what the the fire chief and the police chief are talking about tonight um the mutual aid do we have an mou in place for that or how is that determined is that we a do. handshake we, we is have a, a no we have an mou countywide uh okay. to basically help all the towns in cumberland county and uh, we, we honor those as best we can but uh my directive to our team is we don't leave the town uncovered yep. so we just we can't sometimes we can't go because we have no coverage in town okay Thanks for clarifying that. Appreciate it. Um, anything else from the council this evening? Motion to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second from Council Cop. All those in favor? Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Falmouth would be the perfect partner.